This morning, the race for the Texas Railroad Commission. Candidates Krista Castaneda and Jim Wright are here. With COVID-19 and the low price of crude oil weighing heavily on the Texas economy, are some changes needed at the agency which regulates the oil and gas industry? We'll ask them. Plus, a look at Governor Abbott's order limiting counties to just one absentee ballot drop-off location each. State Senator Paul Bettencourt weighs in about that. Also, what do the long lines and record early voting numbers mean for the November election in this state? Are the 38 electoral votes in Texas really up for grabs this time? And Ross Ramsey discusses the latest on Attorney General Ken Paxton, who has been accused by some of his staffers of bribery and abuse of power. Inside Texas Politics with Jason Whiteley starts now. Good morning, I'm Jason Wheeler in for Jason Whiteley today. Before we sit down with our first guests today, we want to get you caught up on some of the political stories that we're watching. Democratic vice presidential candidate Kamala Harris had to cancel a campaign visit to Texas this weekend after two people in her circle tested positive for COVID-19. Senator Harris tested negative but suspended travel through today just as a precaution. Her camp didn't say where exactly in Texas her visit was supposed to be. A rift appears to have widened between Democrats MJ Hagar and State Senator Royce West. Senator West told the Austin American statesman that he won't vote for Hagar in her bid to unseat Republican Senator John Cornyn. In West's words, Hagar, quote, had a problem all along with black folks, end of quote. The exchange came after last week's debate between Cornyn and Hagar. She hasn't contacted West since she defeated him in the July Democratic primary for the U.S. Senate. Hagar beat West by 30,000 votes out of more than a million ballots that were cast. Nearly all eligible voters in Travis County are now registered to vote this year, a record 97% County's estimated 850,000 eligible voters are registered. The county, which includes all of Metro Austin, went heavily Democratic in the 2016 general election. Nominee Hillary Clinton, in fact, earning more than 66% of the vote there. This morning, we're getting into a race that has big implications for Texans, but that many voters might not be paying close attention to. This is the contest for a seat on the Texas Railroad Commission. Now, despite its name, that commission no longer oversees railroads. The agency actually regulates the oil and gas industry. The two candidates running for a seat on the three member commission are Democrat Krista Castaneda, an engineer and lawyer from Dallas, and Republican Jim Wright, who has owned owned oil services businesses. He is from Orange Grove in South Texas. Both of the candidates are with us today and we're going to start off with Jim Wright. Good morning and thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Jason. Thank you guys for having me. Okay are a political newcomer, even though uh, a lot of people might be very familiar with your name, which you happen to share with the late former U.S. House Speaker Jim Wright, uh, the same name there, but a uh, different candidate uh, entirely for a different office. And right off the top, I just want to ask you, this is a powerful three-member commission that oversees an industry that, as you know right now, uh, is going through historic struggles. What do you plan to do to address that if you are one of the three members of this powerful commission? You know, the uh, Texas Railroad Commission is the, the organization that, that does oversee our natural resources here in Texas. Oil and gas uh, is recognized to be the foundation of what our economy in Texas is really built on. I came to this race with, with my experience to help our industry have a clearer path in continuing our economic growth and to make sure that we uh, have a continued market and that fossil fuels facts versus renewable energy are made up transparent for all the public to to know what those really are. We mentioned off the top that uh, you're an outsider uh, coming into politics here, but uh, you have uh, certainly gotten your feet wet fast here. Democrats have been going after you hard in this race. In fact, the party put out a statement saying uh, that you have no business sitting on the Railroad Commission because as a businessman, you've actually broken the commission's rules 250 times. What do you say to that charge that they came out with uh, pretty early on here? 
Well, you know, those are those are certainly smear tactics. Uh, I can say with with 100% uh, guarantee that those allegations were a case where I did not own that facility. I, I merely was financing it, but I am the guy that stepped up and repossessed it. And I was the only creditor that uh, spent the money to clean all those issues up. And and today I will tell everybody it's repermitted. And I, and I certainly did the right thing in protecting the taxpayer dollars when it came to what the buyers had, had done to that facility. I, I want to ask you this because, I, as I said off the top here, I think a lot of voters uh, tend to not really think a lot about the Texas Railroad Commission. Maybe they don't understand it. Maybe it has something to do with the fact that the name doesn't really explain uh, what the Railroad Commission does. Uh, but this year, it seems like this race has gotten a lot of attention, especially nationally. We've seen a lot of headlines, uh, one of them saying this is the year's most important election for American climate policy. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? This has been framed as a, 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 a basically an environmental race uh, in addition to being a, a race uh, about industry. You now you talked earlier about the businesses that I own. My, all, my businesses revolve around the environmental services. That's what we've done for the energy sector for almost 40 years now. And you're right, this race has been uh, uh, deemed to be something along the lines of what the flaring issue has been um, coming out of the oil and gas industry. That's gas being burned off. And I think off. that it's important, excuse me? That's gas being burned off for people who don't That's know. correct, that's gas being burned off. And, and I think that it's important that people understand exactly what that's doing to our environment. You know, when you look at- Have we done gas enough, do you burned, think, in Texas uh, with regard to those things? Well, I think we stay, uh, we stay not only inside what regulation dictates, but we've gone above and beyond everything that we have available in technology today. You know, one of the facts that remain on flaring is is its emission is CO2. It's it's not any type of volatile compound. Mm -hmm. CO2 is is a uh, uh, part of our our atmosphere today. You know, CO2 is is been here. Uh, I'm not sure that there's enough technology to put blame strictly on what flaring has has caused to the atmosphere. I think that is if you've seen through our history and time, the Earth's going to continue to evolve. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that we have good facts on, on what's causing our climate change, but I can tell you the oil and gas industry has done a good job. The problem we have is, is making sure and ensuring that we have market to put our gas into. Jim Wright, uh, the Republican running for the Texas Railroad Commission. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you so much, Jason, I appreciate it. All right, now we're gonna to cross to the other side of the ballot and speak with Jim Wright's Democratic opponent, Krista Castaneda. Uh, good morning and thank you uh, for being with us today, uh, Ms. Castaneda. Happy to be here. Uh, all right, I'd like to uh, start uh, with the power of this commission. We talked with Jim Wright about this a moment ago. And again, a lot of people may not be paying attention to this. Uh, the Texas Railroad Commission has a lot of authority over oil and gas and pollution by the industry as well. And this has really taken on national significance, this race this time around. Several publications have called this uh, the most important environmental race in the country. Uh, another one says uh, that this little known 2020 race in Texas could shift fossil fuel politics. I know that you have talked uh, a lot about this. Uh, tell us a little bit more about your views about this seat and what you would do if you win it. Sure. Well, it's important to recognize that oil and gas have a prominent place here in Texas and a really important part of our economy. And a lot of our fellow Texans work in the industry, as I have worked in the industry for over 30 years. But it's been against the law for 100 years to flare natural gas, which is the intentional lighting on fire of natural gas, and to vent it to the atmosphere. These are two environmental concerns that have been environmental concerns for all of the time that we've oil and gas, and I'm simply running to get the Railroad Commission back on track in enforcing these laws. We just spoke with your opponent uh, who feels like the oil and gas industry is going above and beyond in regards to these things and, and, and says that uh, he believes that, you know, any uh, climate change uh, does need some more study. What's your feeling about that? 
Well, the industry acknowledges that climate change is real. Um, they came out, the National Petroleum Council, and acknowledged it in December of last year and uh, promoted a plan for carbon capture. Uh, so there's no, no, no doubt that climate change is real and that fossil fuels production impacts it. But that doesn't mean we're sunk. It just means that the oil and gas industry needs to do better with its greenhouse gas emissions. And I'd say about half the industry is very much tuned into this. But the problem is, is the other half of the industry is not. And the current railroad commissioners are unfairly penalizing the people who would follow the law um, with allowing those who would, uh, would sc or scoff laws to get away with uh, not following the law. The Railroad Commission for a long time has been a Republican club. There has not been a Democrat uh, in one of those seats in a couple of decades now. Uh, I want to know, do you worry that more conservative voters here in Texas might see the focus on the environment that you've been talking a lot about as an indication that you might be too tough on a uh, critical Texas industry that's already struggling badly right now? Look, the, the Railroad Commission did nothing to help the industry in the spring when this pandemic hit and the market crashed. Um, I've worked with Republicans. I've worked with people on all across the aisle um, in a variety of capacities. And I know that we could both have oil and gas production here in Texas. I do not support a frack ban. And yet we can have the historic protections for our environment that our fellow Texans have known were important for 100 years. Texans believe in clean air, clean water, don't mess with Texas, and that's what I'm running to get back on track. All right, uh, Krista Castaneda, the uh, Dallas Democrat who is running for a seat on the Texas Railroad Commission. Thank you as well for being with us this morning. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Still to come, will Texans get a COVID-19 vaccine if one becomes available? Don't know about that. Uh, the numbers are in. Uh, Ross Ramsey discusses the results of a recent University of Texas, Texas Tribune poll. Also, the latest in the court battle over Governor Abbott's move to limit the number of absentee ballot locations across Texas. Senator Paul Bettencourt is weighing in on that when we come back. And welcome back. You know, we're not even a year old yet. So on our Yolitix Texas political podcast, we've experienced a lot of firsts. And this week, our first two-time Grammy Award winner, proud Texan Jennifer Holliday, who's also won a Tony, by the way, joins Jason Whiteley and me to talk about a big issue that hasn't gotten a lot of attention in the campaign so far. We're talking about the pandemic's severe effects on the arts. Holliday says the issue may not be top of mind for a lot of voters right now, but it should be because the have the ability to heal the country and vastly improve the economy, but many in the industry feel left behind by pandemic politics. So I want you to grab your phone right now, point your camera right there uh, at that QR code, uh, and it'll take you right to this new episode. You can also get it wherever you find your podcasts and subscribe while you're there because we're going to be busy in the weeks ahead putting out these podcasts. Okay, in his first interview since top aides in his own office accused him of official misconduct, the Attorney General of Texas has come out defiant. AG Ken Paxton saying he was about to place his second in command on investigative leave before that aide joined other staffers in publicly accusing the Attorney General of serious crimes and then they stepped down earlier this month. Paxton spoke to Southeast Texas Record. That's an outlet that says it focuses on legal issues. Issues. Now, we know that a lot of Texans may not be following the fast moving developments on this one closely, so we're bringing in Ross Ramsey with the Texas Tribune uh, in Austin to give us an update on the Paxton scandal today. Uh, good morning, Ross. How are you, Jason? Good to see you. Doing well. Thanks for asking. Uh, so, this is a case where Paxton is saying that they're the wrongdoers, not me, that a co worker accused me just as I was closing in on him. And his now former second in command, Jeff Mateer, says he didn't know that Paxton planned to place him on leave. What is going on here? Well, we still have all of the original open questions. Why was Ken Paxton investigating? the feds basically with a hired lawyer on behalf of a campaign donor why did the seven top lawyers in the ag's office write a letter file it with hr basically a whistleblower accusing the ag of bribery and other things there's a lot still to sort out here even though we've now stopped the investigation paxton is no longer pursuing this this investigation 
there's still a lot to ask. And at such a critical time, too. I uh, want to quickly discuss a recent University of Texas, Texas Tribune poll now. Voters uncertain about the acceptance of election results and only a minority of Texans saying that they get a COVID-19 vaccine if one's available. Yeah, only 42% said if a vaccine was widely available and at low cost that they would actually get the vaccine. There was some trepidation about whether a vaccine would be presented before it's ready to go. And then when we asked them about voting and said, will you and the people that you know trust the results of the presidential election when you see them, most people, uh, no, you know, we didn't have a majority saying no, but we did have a majority saying, yes, I'll trust the results. And I'm not sure I'll trust the results. So hmm. um, some trepidation out there. All right, uh, Ross, thanks for that. Stick around. We'll see you again here on the uh, Reporters Roundtable in just a few minutes. Mm -hmm. Texas voters are turning out in record numbers to vote early, but Governor Abbott's order to limit mail-in drop-off locations to just one in each county is facing legal challenges. Uh, recently, a state judge ruled that the governor doesn't have the authority to limit absentee ballot hand delivery locations. We want to bring in State Senator Paul Betancourt about this ruling now. Betancourt is a Republican who represents Senate District 7, which encompasses most of West Harris County, uh, which of course is a gigantic county. Uh, and there's one drop off location in that one, just like everywhere else. And uh, here we are in a pandemic and in a year when we may see record turnout. Uh, Senator Betancourt, I uh, want to ask you here, do you worry that this might negatively impact Republican voters as well, especially perhaps seniors who Republicans do very well with traditionally, who might not trust the mail, feeling like it's been slowed down too much, uh, and that it might possibly make it uh, so inconvenient for them that some of them just choose not to participate in the process? No, it, it's a good question, Jason, but the answer is no, and here's why. First off, people are now, because we are having record turnout, they're going into early voting locations and saying, please cancel my absentee ballot, I wish to vote today. And they can do that at any of the 112 locations in Harris County. What the rest of the story is, is about the fact that the absentee ballot drop-off was designed to be one location, the central count in every county, and that's the law that, quite frankly, has been on the books when, uh, uh, you know, when the county judge uh, won her race down here at Eldago at 18, it was the same law. It when Hillary Clinton carried both Dallas County and uh, and Harris County in 2016, it was the same law. Mm. So uh, we're what's happened is that the appellate court in New Orleans, the Fifth Circuit, ruled in favor of the governor's position, and and that's why. Uh, now, many states, including Republican-run states, Senator, have expansive voting by mail, and yet study after study shows no instances of widespread voter fraud. Is limiting the number of drop-off spots essentially fixing a problem that exists only in theory? And doesn't the state have the know-how, the resources, or at least the authority to make sure that multiple drop-off sites would be secure, especially in a pandemic? Well, Jason, just to the north of you in Gray County, the attorney general got indictments out on a county commissioner and a ring about absentee ballot frauds, well over 100 indictments. So there is fraud with absentee ballots. Now, what we're talking about here again is that any voter really anywhere in the state, whether it's Clay Jenkins, the county judge, who won his election in 18 under the same law I'm talking about, he could go into any uh, polling location and say, I don't want to have my ballot uh, done by mail. I want it canceled and I want to vote today. And so that's the law that's on the books. The, the law that, that was ruled uh, in favor of the governor by the Fifth Circuit is back to the point of where do you actually turn in the physical ballot itself? Mm -hmm. And that has to be at the central count station because you have to have poll watchers watching that activity and what was going to happen before the governor's proclamation is we were going to have a dozen drop off sites, but no poll watchers. And that's not transparent government either. All right. We'll see if we've heard the last word on this. It's been bouncing <laughs> around in the federal courts and the state courts. Uh, uh, thanks for being with us today, uh, Senator Betancourt. No problem. Fifth Circuit, it's not going to be appealed. So that's going to be the final word on this this cycle. But thanks for your time. All right, uh, we uh, started off there talking about that record turnout in early voting, early on anyway. What does that really mean? We're going to get into our reporters roundtable to explore that next. This is Inside Texas Politics with Jason Whiteley. 
All right, time once again for our reporters roundtable to put the headlines into perspective. Ross is back with us from the Texas Tribune, also joining us each week. Bud Kennedy from the Fort Worth Star Telegram, plus Bernadine Steptoe, the political producer at WFAA in Dallas. Uh, thanks to all of you for uh, joining once again. So everybody's been talking about these huge numbers of early voters in places like Houston and Tarrant County, really in all of the urban centers across the state. We still have two full weeks to go. So what do we make of these long lines? and these big numbers, these early voting turnouts that we're seeing, uh, which have turned into records in week one, bud. Well, you know, it, 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 a lot of these early voters, these are people who always vote. That's what the records show. These are Democrats, Republicans. These are regular voters. They're not new people. What we need to see, we see uh, obviously a million in Harris, uh, uh, more than a million now in Dallas and Tarrant. Those are the second and third largest counties. But we don't see anybody new. We'll see if anybody new comes out the next couple of weeks. Ross, what do you say about uh, what we've been seeing across the state so far? Well, you know, more than 2 million people voted in the first week of early voting. It's hard to tell until you get to the end whether that was exuberance and people just wanted to vote early as quickly as they could or whether it's a sign of a really big turnout. But we can say that at least in this first week, voters were excited about it, ready to go and uh, willing to line up for it. Yeah, a lot of people have been questioning whether we can keep up this pace for the expanded early voting this time around. Bernadine, what say you? I think that we will keep up that pace because everybody, as uh, Bud said, they're excited and they're going to continue going to the polls all the way up until Election Day. Hmm. And uh, we've been seeing those long lines snaking around a lot of these voting centers. Uh, so we may see more of that in the weeks to come here, especially in the middle of a pandemic. A lot of folks not comfortable with what they might encounter on Election Day itself. Uh, big thanks to all of you once again uh, for uh, putting the headlines into perspective with us here. And uh, we want to thank you at home for watching as well. And we will see you right back here next Sunday on Inside Texas Politics. In the meantime, stay healthy, have a great week. And if you haven't already done so, get out and vote.